the faculty members for the OI Tel Echo Clinic. Dr. Nagamani, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. It's a, a distinct pleasure for me and the other faculty members here to introduce Dr. Deb Krakow, uh, who's our speaker today. Dr. Krakow completed her medical school at Chicago Medical School and did her residency in OBGYN and fellowships in maternal fetal medicine as well as clinical genetics at uh, UCLA, after which she stayed back uh, in LA and now she is the professor and chair of obstetrics and gynecology at UCLA and David Geffen School of Medicine. She's also a professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery as well as in human genetics. Dr. Krakow, other than her institutional leadership uh, responsibilities, also has many leadership responsibilities on the national level in professional societies of OBGYN as well as genetics. She is the co-director for the International Schedule Dysplasia Registry and she serves as the uh, chair for the NI study section uh, for skeletal biology development and uh, disease. She's also a member of the OIF um, MAC. Dr. Krakow has a long-standing history of uh, interest and accomplishments in uh, rare skeletal uh, diseases, including OI, and we're delighted to have her talk today, Dr. Krakow. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Nagamani. That's a very generous. Um and thoughtful introduction. So I am here to sort of give you a way of thinking of, of management of pregnancy and delivery in patients with osteogenesis imperfecta. And, you know, overall, I think all of us, particularly who practice um, genetics are actually very, very supportive of our patients becoming pregnant, but we wanna make sure that we understand how their underlying genetic conditions could perhaps interact with a pregnancy. I don't have any disclosures. So as this group knows, osteogenesis imperfecta is also known as brittle bone disease, and it's a genetically heterogeneous um, disorder. It's inherited as an autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and X-linked. And I think it's really important to, to know this in terms of educate, edu educating our colleagues in, in OB in terms of um, recurrence risk. So it's characterized by different classification schemes, as you know, that there's the phenotypic findings, and we use subjective terms, including mild, moderate, severe, and perinatal lethal, or we use a sort of the Salinth classification of OI type one, two, three, and four with subclassifications. Um, one classification scheme uses um, Roman numerals, um, types 1 through 21, and that is based on the specific altered gene. So, you know, one of the, the things that I'm really, really interested in is, are there gaps in knowledge when it comes to OI in general, and particularly OI in pregnancy? And how do these gaps affect our patients and our practice? I would say that historically, the medical community, including the obstetrical community, has not been, I would say, overwhelmingly supportive of pregnancy and women with short stature, particularly the more severe forms. And I think for those of us involved in OI, is does pregnancy and breastfeeding have any effect on the skeleton? Obviously, disorders that have decreased bone mineralization, is that going to be an issue? Are the pregnancy complications in women with OI um, any different than the normative data, including the milder forms? Are the fetal or the newborn outcomes the same between women with OI versus average stature women? Um, and that would include gestational age of delivery, birth weight, birth length, and is it independent of genotype? And what's the best mode of delivery or timing for delivery in women with OI? So I think the first place to start, and at least this is how I start when I think of seeing anyone with a genetic disorder, is what are the maternal physiologic adaptations that occur in pregnancy? And would have any of these adaptations um, cross, cross paths with the underlying physiology of the genetic disorder? So there are obviously major adaptations in, in maternal anatomy, physiology, and metabolism that occur to achieve a successful pregnancy. Um, total body water increases from 6.5 to 8 liters. Blood volume increases to one by 1 1.5 liters. The water content of the fetus, the placenta, and the amniotic fluid is 3.5 liters. 
And one way to think about it, or like how we teach our OB residents is that pregnancy is actually a state of chronic volume overload. And the reason why to think about that is if you have either a medical or genetic condition where volume would matter, then it's gonna interfere with normal physiologic adaptations. And there's an increased cardiac output of 5.6 liters per minute to 6.2 liters per minute. And in twins, it can go as high as seven liters per minute. So these are sort of, these are not sort of, these are the adaptations that happen in the cardiovascular system in the first trimester versus in the last trimester. And I think as you can outline and see that cardiac output is the most significant where the, um, you, you can over a pre-pregnant state, you can increase your cardiac output by almost 50%. Heart rate increases, um, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance decrease as well as oncotic pressure. So there are both good things and bad things that happen in pregnancy. So obviously based on published guidelines by the American College of Cardiology, we would want to achieve the same goals in a woman with OI that we would achieve in a woman um, who is just pregnant, which we, do, we want to have, the goal should be achieving maximum cardiac output and stabilizing that. If there is some degree of cardiac dysfunction present, precautions are indicated. There is the recommendation of a pre-echocardiogram and echocardiograms each trimester to determine cardiac output. If there is advanced disease, consideration for corrective valvular surgery should be ideally performed prior to surgery. So for example, while in OI, it is rare to have a really damaged mitral valve, if it is, we would prefer that the valve is replaced prior to pregnancy. Um, mechanical valves and anticoagulation in pregnancy have added complications. So if you're caring for a patient who already has a mechanical valve, whether or not you can use anticoagulation versus having to use Coumadin, is, which is a teratogen in the first trimester is always a, a big debate. And if the ejection fraction is less than 45%, there's a very high incidence of both fetal and maternal morbidity. It is, pregnancy is high risk for individuals who have a cardiac dysfunction of um, a diminished ejection fraction of less than 40%. Overall, I do not think that this is a large issue for individuals in our community unless they have significant restrictive lung disease or core pulmonale. In OI, there are both case reports and some small retrospective series on um, cardiac dysfunction in OI. And mitral valve regurgitation aortic regurgitation, AFib, flutter, and heart failure have been documented in OI and statistically higher than the general population. But I put an asterisk there because the highest risk is again for those individuals over the age of 50, which is not typically what a, the reproductive age of women who are getting pregnant um, is. The most common valvular dysfunction in any connective tissue in general is aortic regurgitation. Um, in OI, aortic regurgitation is not actually as common as mitral valve regurgitation, but it has still been reported. And if there is aortic regurgitation, you need to typically do an afterload reduction to reduce the stress on the left ventricle. And the best way to reduce stress in the left ventricle are ACE inhibitors, but ACE inhibitors in pregnancy are considered a teratogen. So again, this sort of adds an extra layer of, of complexity if the patient is presenting as such. There are multiple pulmonary ad adaptations that occur in, in pregnancy. And I think it's really important because if you ever look at any pregnant woman, they always look to, like they're huffing and puffing, and, and actually they are. 
Um, there are changes in the configuration of the thoracic chain uh, cage. It gets sort of wider um, in girth and it gets sort of deeper. So it becomes much more barrel shaped in pregnancy. There's a relaxation of the ligaments between the ribs and the sternum. The subcostal angle increases from 68, degree, 68 degrees to 103 degrees. And as I said, the transverse diameter um, expands as well as the chest circumference. Obviously, if you have a bad scoliosis in core pulmonale, this is not going to add, um, it's not going to help. The diaphragm, the diaphragm raises four centimeters, and, but the diaphragmatic excursion only increases by two centimeters. And that is frequently why pregnant women are saying that they feel short of breath. And these changes lead to changes in static lung volumes. So again, a table, and I'm happy to make this available to anyone who wants it, but these are all the pulmonary changes that occur in pregnancy. And, and most of the ones that are to me of, of significant is that your inspiratory capacity increases, your tidal volume increases, but your functional residual capacity decreases and your residual volume also decreases. And so your total lung capacity overall decreases a small percentage. Again, for most women, this is not of any significant consequence, but it is if you have underlying pulmonary issues. Kyphoscoliosis um, occurs actually in almost 1% of the US fe um, female population. And for our community, actually in osteogenesis imperfecta, it can be a significant problem. It was historically considered a contraindication to pregnancy. I no longer believe that it is. The primary concern is not the appearance of the kyphoscoliosis, but of car cardiopulmonary compromise due to mechanical restrictions associated with the spinal deformity, which as I noted, can be further exacerbated by pregnancy related conditions. And patients with large deformities greater than 120 degrees can be associated with alveolar hypoventilation which would require sort of blood gas monitoring and non-invasive ventilation with either positive pressure ventilation or with BiPAP throughout pregnancy. I've only taken care of one patient who needed um, BiPAP during pregnancy, but it'd be interesting to hear from my colleagues if this is something that you've um, been involved in. So what are the pulmonary issues um, in pregnancy and OI? As pregnancy advances, there's an increased ventilation and increased O2 consumption. And any restrictive lung disease secondary to congenital, unrepaired, or progressive scoliosis should be of concern. Restrictive lung disease without kyphoscoliosis has been just reported in osteogenesis imperfecta in 2020 by Kathy Raggio and, and Sandy Sandhouse's group, um, but it, it was not severe. Similar to those individuals with low cardiac injection fractions, outcomes in women who have vital capacities of less than 1.5 liters or less than 50% of what's predicted are known to have poor outcomes. Again, most of the individuals we take care of with OI do not um, reach this level of, of, of pulmonary compromise, but it, it is from a counseling standpoint, something to remember. Um, there are very, very few studies on restrictive lung disease in pregnancy. Um, many more studies on obstetric obstructive lung disease in pregnancy. It is actually relatively uncommon. Most of the studies are not in women with OI at all. It's in women with severe kyphoscoliosis, neuromuscular disorders, or pr primary parenchymal lung diseases. And so some of the recommendations and some of the outcomes are based on other disorders and not OI. Um, in one study that was done by Lipinski in 2014, which I thought was the largest one that I could find, um, there were small changes in forced vital capacity in the group and pregnancy and outcomes in this group. And there was an increased incidence of preterm delivery with women who had a forced vital capacity at 40%. So again, this is translating what is known in other disorders to OI. And I'm not 100% sure that we can do that 
But again, from a counseling perspective, I think it's important. So what happens in the muscular skeletal system? Um, pregnancy was initially referred to as the physiologic state of hyperparathyroidism because the maternal skeleton needed to lose calcium to supplement the fetus. Um, it historically was thought to learn, lead to long-term maternal bone loss. I think that that has been refuted. Um, the majority of evidence that the fetal skeleton, um, fetal calcium needs are met are through increased calcium absorption actually in the first and second trimester um, through the GI tract and not the maternal skeleton. So it's really the only maternal skeleton is at risk during the third trimester and during bre breastfeeding. Um, as I said, the fetus accumulates about 21 grams of total calcium and 80% of this is during the third trimester. The, the bad news about that is most of it that then is coming from the maternal skeleton. Um, and as I said, maternal calcium is maintained in the first and second trimester through the GI tract. Um, and in the third trimester, obviously, um, maternal bone is at risk. So, but this is very controversial and something that we're hoping to study um, in our group, in our consortium, is what's the long-term effect on bone metabolism um, and pregnancy? There is increased bone loss, um, and it's estimated that bone density loss is about two to 5% during pregnancy. And there is increased bone turnover and remodeling in pregnancy. There's absolutely increased bone loss with breastfeeding. However, when you look at parity, which is the number of times you've been pregnant, there is no association in the literature in the general population or the non-OI population with parity and osteoporosis later in life. The type of bone loss that is lost is trabecular and not cortical. And there is um, no really good evidence that increasing calcium intake during pregnancy and lactation is going to prevent bone loss. Most of the present studies in terms of the recommendations by both ACOG and the Canadian OBGYN group is that the appropriate amount of calcium intake is about a thousand milligrams a day. So what are the special considerations that we have to think about in OI and pregnancy? One, which parent is affected? And so, you know, I take care of pregnancies in which the male is affected. Um, and how is that gonna influence pregnancies? Obviously are both parents affected and that would change your counseling. Is the genetic change known? What is the mode of inheritance to predict the relative risk to the offspring? What are the parents' feelings about the risk of an affected child? And, and I think you'll see later in our studies, there was an increased incidence of use of um, in vitro fertilization um, in our study, which suggests to us that, that parents are making some decision about whether or not they wanna pass on their allele. Um, is the patient already pregnant versus a preconceptual counseling? Because if the patient's already pregnant, um, it, it's a little more of what we refer to as a fire drill. And obviously are the parents interested in considering in vitro fertilization? So this is one of the case reports that I want to um, illustrate and we can talk about. This is an ultrasound of a patient that I saw in 2020. Um, and you can see that this is the calvarium. So this is the head. And instead of it being all nice and white right here, it's got areas of white, gray, and black. And so this is a undermineralized calvarium. These are the ribs and you can see that there's a line here with fractures, they're wavy. And this is pictures of the radius, ulna and the humerus. And you can see that there is a chevron here, which is a fracture and the humerus, the mineralization is extremely spotty. Um, I counseled the family that this was osteogenesis imperfecta and that I recommended genetic testing and they declined. Um, and the fetus was born and it died of severe respiratory compromise. They came back less than a year later, pregnant again. And I saw the same thing. 
And this is an X-ray of the second fetus. Um, very similar phenotype um, and obviously recurrent with thin wavy ribs. I think most people would call this by the Sloan's classification, OI type 2C because of the thin wavy ribs, but it's clearly perinatal lethal OI. And you can see that there was very little insufflation of the chest on x-ray, there's no black. Um, we went on to find MESD2 mutations just recently in the second case. Um, and the family is now electing to go for in vitro fertilization. So for people with OI and pregnancy, what are the issues that we have to consider and what's, how do we protect their musculoskeletal health? The suggested amount of calcium to be used in pregnant women by both ACOG um, is about a thousand milligrams per day minimum if greater than 19 years old. If you're under 19, it's 1500. The WHO recommends much higher calcium intake per day because their populations overall have um, food scarcity and their amount of calcium they may get from just nutritional sources may be diminished. The recommendation is about folate is 600 milligrams per day, which is the amount in a prenatal vitamin. The recommendation is to maintain normal vitamin D levels at greater than 32 nanograms per mil. And again, 600 international units per day. Again, what is in a prenatal vitamin? Patients with kyphoscoliosis greater than 25 degrees should be checked each trimester for worsening of their scoliosis. We know scoliosis in general in the non-OI population in pregnancy, it can worsen. There should be an increased awareness that pregnancy induces ligamentous laxity, and it could theoretically increase your risk of fractures if you have any balance issues or dislocation. Um, and for osteogenesis in perfecta, there was a previous suggestion in the literature, there was an increased incidence of severe back pain in pregnancy, and perhaps this could be due to vertebral fractures. One of the things that I wanna talk about is transient osteoporosis of the hip. Um, one, because I'm looking for patients, um, because I think this is unreported in our community. It is a very, very, very rare complication seen in pregnancy and lactation. It is considered the etiology is unknown. It is spontaneous in onset. It is characterized by severe pain and MRI findings of bone marrow edema. It usually occurs at the hip, but can also be seen at the knee, ankle, shoulder, elbow, and wrists. The treatments include physical therapy, passive immobilization, bisphosphonates, vitamin D supplementation, and um, surgical intervention if it if the patient's very unstable to reduce tissue pressure. While it is extremely rare, um, it has been reported in the literature in eight women with osteoporosis. And when I went and read this very limited literature on osteoporosis of the hip in pregnancy, almost all the case reports said it was reported in women with a strong family history of osteoporosis. So I do wonder if this is something that is um, perhaps, um, I don't want to say unique, but underreported in OI and maybe just distinct in OI, and there's a confusion with OI and osteoporosis in the obstetrical literature. So um, our Brittle Bones Consortium did a study on OI and pregnancy, and I, I think for many of you, you've heard us report on this so many times. But it was a retrospective study. It was um, done on 172 pregnancies. It was compared with normative data. Um, so we chose parameters to evaluate where there was normative data. And what we found was that overall, the women with OI obviously um, had shorter stature and lower bone um, BMI. There was an increased cesarean section rate. There was an increase, increased use of in vitro, in vitro fertilization relative to the general population. We saw an increased incidence of gestational diabetes, and we don't know why. There was absolute increased incidence for the need for transfusion after delivery. 
there was an increased incidence of fractures in the antepartum and postpartum period. 10% of the people who answered the questionnaire had had a fraction in the third trimester or in the first six weeks postpartum. There was an increased incidence of low birth weight statistically that was not related to whether or not the fetus had OI. And there was also an increased incidence of NICU admissions and neonatal mortality not related to whether or not the fetus had OI or not. We think that perhaps the increased incidence of NICU admissions was related to um, increased prematurity, but we don't have um, the supporting data for that. So what is the management of a delivery in a patient with OI? And I think that for patients who are mildly affected and near normal height, the maternal pel pelvis should be um, adequate for vaginal delivery and the obstetrician has to determine that. And there are other disorders of shorter stature that we, I think, can deliver vaginally, and that would also include mild OI, hypochondroplasia, and mild disorders like multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. I always have to remind people that cesarean sections are extremely traumatic deliveries. You're actually trying to get a fetus out of a very small hole. Um, if the fetus is known to have OI, or it has not been established that the fetus has OI, but it is at risk for OI, um, there is gonna be mild decreased mineralization of the calvarium. And I would recommend no instrumentation to the fetal head because it can lead to subdural hematomas. And we have seen this. The type of anesthesia can be regional versus general. It's extremely patient specific. Each carries inherent risk. And it's really important that a patient with OI meet with anesthesia prior to delivery, particularly if they're more severely affected and have instruments in their spine, because this is gonna be an issue for the anesthesiologist to determine what they're most comfortable with. Um, management of a patient in a wheelchair is, again, there's no literature in the general obstetrics population, but the concerns that I would raise is that if you are in a wheelchair and pregnant, you're more likely to have a severe form of OI, which would statistically make you at more risk for cardiopulmonary complications, but not 100%. Immobility places pregnant women at risk for thromboembolic events, um, and 5% of the population is already at risk for a thrombophilia, and pregnancy can unmask a thrombophilia, so this is just my personal opinion. But if somebody is pregnant in a wheelchair, I would um, work them up for thrombophilias just to make sure I'm not adding a second um, comorbidity to their pregnancy. Um, normally, immobile pi patients are placed on routine anticoagulation with heparin and Lovenox. This comes with its own complications. And as we know, long-term heparin use decreases bone mineral density that is based on long-term use, not on short-term use, but it's something that we as a group have to think about. I think the breast benefits of breastfeeding are clearly established. Um, unlike pregnancy, most of the calcium obtained for breast milk is mobilized from bone. And there are estimates of a decrease in DEXA score after breastfeeding of approximately 5%. It appears also that most women seem to recover. Again, the controversy about whether high parity is associated with osteoporosis or not, it has not been studied extensively. There are small case reports where overall the data supports that women do, in, do re, regain um, bone density, but this is the average stature population. Um, Fractures, as we know in our community, are increased in the postpartum period. Um, and again, I bring this up that breastfeeding, if you have rhizomelia or a short trunk, can be technically difficult. Um, and it's something that we as be, need to be advocates for in terms of supporting women if they don't want to do it. Also supporting women if it's easier to pump and not to hold the baby. And that the benefits of breastfeeding have been well established at least for the first six weeks of life. And so for patients who breastfeeding is physically difficult, 
then you know I, I do everything I can to try to get them through at least the first six weeks of, of their newborn's life. Um, so again, short stature, um, it really depends on what the anesthesia ologist is comfortable with and whether or not there is hardware in the spine or there's any other spinal abnormalities. Um, the studies on bisphosphonates in pregnancy, no one is advocating for this. It does cross the um, placenta and studies in rats showed high dose bisphosphonate resulted in maternal and fetal toxicities. However, there are more than a hundred articles where bisphosphonates were given, given either intentionally in pregnancy because of cancer or inadvertently and it turns out that there was an increased incidence of lower birth weight, but overall, um, it, it would not, in my mind, be a contraindication to continuing the pre pregnancy. Um, for women who were treated with bisphosphonates in the third trimester um, for malignant hypercalcemia, the fetus has had some hypo, transient hypocalcemia after where they were born. I am not advocating for this, but again, just sometimes we see patients who um, come in the first trimester with drug exposures and being able to counsel them properly um, is, is helpful. And I wanna thank you for your attention.